Thanks for the introduction. Welcome everyone. I hope everyone's having a good time at this virtual conference today. Uh, kudos and thanks to the staff and uh, Stephen for putting this together and running this. Uh, really great and encouraging to see all these, these uh, conferences that have continued even though virtual. So this is awesome. And another great uh, side effect is the fact that people that normally couldn't attend these are able to attend. People that geographically distanced that couldn't make it. So this is an awesome deal. So it's really been great this year be able to have so much access to so many great conferences online. So, uh, so you heard a little bit about me. So just a little more detail on my background. I like to share this background because um, it kind of gives you an idea of how I got into pen testing. And so, you, you know, you can relate your own path where you're at and how that can relate into becoming a pen tester if that's something you're interested in. So I've been in IT and InfoSec for over 22 years. I've been in InfoSec specifically since 2004. Started out doing network security. Did that for about a year and a half, moved into application security. And application security is where I learned that I wanted to be a pen tester. I was using web application vulnerability scanners. Started go, you know, attending some different little uh, vendor talks on different tools and really got interested in, in pen testing. So uh, in 2012, I got laid off from my job and I went to work as a pen tester. So I've been pen testing for a little over eight years. The first five years was spent in consulting. If you ever get the chance to consult, that's a great way to get a lot of experience really quick, get a, you know exposure to a lot of different environments than you would in just one place. So that's really molded and helped my career a lot. I'm also the co-host of the Uncommon Journey podcast, and this is a podcast on becoming, you know, we're getting into information security. And uh, I co-host this podcast with Alyssa Miller and Chloe Mastagi. So a little more to my background, just to kind of show if you're doubting that you or don't think you can do this. You know, I was a former meathead, you know, powerlifter, pro wrestler, and never thought I'd ever be paid to use my mind to think. <clears throat> So I started, I was a pro wrestler after high school, and then I had to find a more stable career because I got married. So I went to trade school to become a, dra a CAD draftsman. And during my drafting career, I found out about sysadmin work. I was working for a company and we were billed like out at, they were billed out twice of our hourly rate. And then I noticed the sysadmin was making about 10, would have worked out to be about $10 an hour more than what we were making. And what they were doing seemed a lot more interesting. So I became a sysadmin, did that for a little over six years, moved into information security and then pen testing. And so this is a this is a slide I share each semester with my ethical hacking class, and my web app pen testing class. With great power comes great responsibility. Only hack if you have permission and even better written permission. Hacking without permission is illegal. If you get into legal problems, then that makes it hard to get any kind of job development, IT, security in general. So you wanna really be careful when you're doing any kind of hacking, make sure you have permission. Uh, this can be done practice-wise through CTFs or bug bounties, but make sure you have permission. You don't want, it's not worth getting in trouble. What is pen testing? So pen testing is assessing security from an adversarial perspective, attempting to exploit vulnerabilities to get unauthorized access to systems and sensitive data, also known as hacking. And so one of the things I like to do here too is people new to the community, people just getting started, you know, make sure you differentiate between hacker and cyber criminal. There's a lot of people in the industry that are in, that are offended by that. And, you know, starting off on the wrong foot by labeling them negatively is, is a bad thing. So just re remember that. So. And keeping that in mind, you know, be able to assess security from what an adversary or a cyber criminal would would view is a way to uncover vulnerabilities that may not otherwise be detected. You may run a vulnerability scan, but unless you're able to get on that system, you really don't truly understand how vulnerable that system is. And exploitable vulnerabilities are higher risk and a higher priority for remediation. Sometimes remediation, these security flaws can be very expensive. It could mean replacing firewalls or adding new software, possibly adding new security roles to the company. So this could be expensive and an exploitable vulnerability is uh, 
higher risk and more of a priority to remediate. And so this a lot of times go into the justification for budgeting new, new equipment and staff too. So this is why this is really important. Also regulatory compliance, PCI, DSS, the payment card industry data security standard has driven a lot of pen testing over the past several years. I used to work for a bank and we had like a 13 person pen test team and all of our pen testing was focused on PCI. That was the reason in the, what drove the pen test and the budgeting for the staff of that size to perform pen tests. It's a fun job and there's a lot of opportunities as pen testing. When I got started in 2012, most of the pen test jobs were either contract or consulting jobs. And so as PCI and other uh, industry needs and compliance has come along, then there's been more opportunity for jobs. If you have like 500 applications you need tested for a company and you go through a consulting company, you're gonna spend a lot of money. So if you have your own internal staff, then that makes it a little more affordable. In pen testing jobs, when you're looking for a pen testing job, you know, the more professional terms, you know, you've heard, you've heard pen tester, but penetration tester is the long-term uh, form of the name, security consultants, analysts, and engineers. So a lot of times you have to kind of dig down into the description, doc, job description sometimes to see if it's a pen testing job, because a lot of times you're going to see consultant or engineer. So other terms synonymous with uh, pen testing is ethical hackers, offensive security, adversarial security, and threat and vulnerability management is a popular department where some of these type of functions reside under. There's other skills that pen testing is important in. So you may not be, pen testing may not be your goal. Maybe this is interesting, you wanna learn the skill and maybe you, you, know, you aspire to be a pen tester, but these skills will help you as you're learning along the way. If you're a SOC analyst, you're able to understand malicious traffic better same same with a security analyst, network security analyst and engineers, understanding that malicious traffic. Digital forensics and incident response. This is important that you're able to identify malicious traffic and it helps you to, to uh, investigate your, your cases better if you understand the hacker mindset, understand these attacks. Uh, purple teams, this is beginning to be something pretty popular where the red team offense and defense are working together to improve the defenses. During pen tests, you can monitor the activity, see if that it's being detected, and then you know once you're finished, go back and, and run some of these types of attacks and tune your systems to make sure they're actually detecting that malicious behavior on the network. Also, you know, you're testing the people that are defending the network. And application security, this is another popular area. And one of the areas, if you're wanting to do pen testing, that through bug bounties, it's a quick way to get experience through uh, working in production applications. And different types of pen test targets. It's not all just cut and dry network. You have your wireless networks. And then when you're testing networks, you wanna test it internally as well as external. External is not only a threat, sometimes internal. There was, there's been stats thrown around over the years and uh, I've seen sometimes that threats that are actually Internal can be up to 60 to 70% of the time. Not sure on the exact stats on that, but there are insider threats. You know, there are people that will try to steal intellectual property that are actually hired, that'll get a, a job within the company to go into the company to steal the intellectual property. So the uh, adversaries are internal as well as external. And then wireless and external, this is, you know, outside facing. You know, someone doesn't have to be inside your building to attack your, your network. So these are very important. Applications are very important because, uh, you know, a lot of the applications before used to be thick clients sitting on your desktop while you still have your Microsoft Office and those sort of tools. A lot of the applications have gone to web-based because web-based is more mobile. You can run it on mobile devices, different operating systems, and some, you know, kiosks and all sorts of things. So it's a lot more flexible application. Uh, that people are using. So those are there's a big need for testing that as well as cloud and, and mobile applications. Hardware, testing the routers and switches, testing products, you know, hard, you know, network hardware products. You know, when they create new routers and switches, they need to test the security on those. That way they, any bugs can be remediated before they're released out into the public. IoT, 
is another popular area. Medical devices, pacemakers, and insulin pumps are, are connected by Bluetooth, even Wi-Fi. I've done wireless pen tests before where for hospitals that I was going through there doing my scans and I saw, you know, medical devices showing up on the wireless network, as well as I've done pen tests for for manufacturers of medical devices. And just seeing those devices attached to a network kind of gives you a little, you know, kind of uh, wears you a little bit, kind of scares you of what the possibilities could be. You know, these are devices that if taken down, it could harm someone. So it's really important that they're secured as well as transportation with the self-driving vehicles uh, on the horizon and soon to be out. We need to make sure those are secure because if someone was able to take control over a self-driving vehicle, you know, they could cause a lot of harm. So we need to make sure that those are secure. Uh, people in buildings, you know, you have to make sure that the people that are doing the job of protecting your company, whether they're security or just people that are uh, just employees in different areas, you may have to make sure, you need to make sure that they're not letting people in the building without proper access and, and protecting your company. So the way you test that is through social engineering. And you also test the building security, like through physical security testing. So these are a lot of times part of red teaming activities, but these are all important areas that need to be tested. And based on where you may start out is based on the experience you have. If you have experience in networking, then network pen testing may be the, the area for you to go into. If you're a developer, then application pen testing is going to come more easy for you, as well as if you have experience working with hardware, you know, firmware and that kind of stuff. So work look in these different areas maybe if the the uh, spot that you may want to focus on where you want to start your career as a pen tester and types of pen testing knowledge when you're doing a pen test there's amount of knowledge that the tester has you know the black box pen test is going to be more similar to what an attacker is going to try to perform and it's important to do this while the white box or crystal box pen test is is important as well maybe that exterior is really tough to get into but if someone was able to find some someone's password or you know brute force the password to get into it then you need to be able to test all the other security controls so with application pen tests you want to use a account level for each level of access to thoroughly test that system and a lot of these are based on the amount of time you have if you have a lot of time then uh, you can do a black box that requ requires more reconnaissance, more time to test, whereas the white box or crystal box test requires less time because you have more knowledge of the system. You can have anything from like on top of accounts, you can have diagrams of the network as well as documentation about how the application is written, written even source code. You know, these are helpful in testing. So th that provides a more thorough test. And gray box testing is kind of more common of what you're going to see as a pen tester. It's kind of a cross between the two methods. They give you enough information to be able to test the application or network well without giving you too much or too little. So it's kind of a happy medium between the two. And that can vary. Not everything is set in stone. There's not just those three identical you know, types of knowledge you could do you know, it could be more defined or less defined. So there's a lot of variance in there and it's gonna depend on the time and different types of pen test steps. Now these first two, as you see the red text, it's not a pen test. Vulnerability scans is not a pen test. This is running a scanner to look for vulnerabilities. And this is actually part of a pen test is running vulnerability scans. And then your vulnerability assessments is the next step above. You run your vulnerability scans and then you validate those vulnerabilities to make sure they're not false positives. And you can also run other tools during this process to detect vulnerabilities that maybe the vulnerability scanner might have missed. And so the next step of these uh, methods is pen testing. So basically, you've done your vulnerability scans, we've validated any of the vulnerabilities, found any extra vulnerabilities with other tools. So now we're gonna go in and try to exploit or hack any of the vulnerabilities that we found that are not false positives. Once you get in that system, you can see if you can go further. And then you get into your red teaming or adversarial test. This is where you're testing the blue team. It's an attack simulation, less restrictive in scope usually. So that way you're able to go in and test the reactions. So you want to make sure 
that the IR team is seeing this activity, that your IPS and IDS is detecting this, so you can shut down any of those kind of activities. So it's a good way, a good exercise to test the test the blue team. And different specializations. So we kind of covered some of the different targets. So some of these specializations there are in, in pen testing. Most people are going to start out as a generalist. This is the way I started out. I did network pen testing and eventually moved in shortly after into Wi-Fi pen testing and then some light web application. So even though it's a network pen test, you're going to find web-based clients, uh, web-based uh, servers and, and admin portals for different administrative consoles. So there's so sometimes that may be your only way in as a, a pen tester into the network is through the web application layer. And so there's applications, web app, mobile, thick client and cloud, and then social engineering. A lot of people, there's some people that will specialize in social engineering, dealing with you know physical and security and and social engineering people. I've known people who got their start that had no technical background, but they were really good at talking to people, had really good people skills, and were good at social engineering. So that was a way for them to start. So that's a place for someone to start. A lot of people just seem to be drawn to that area. It seems more fun, a little more thrilling to do. So that's kind of a an interesting area and gets a lot of interest from people wanting to break in. And then transportation, there's companies, a lot of the automobile industries, they've got people to test their their uh, vehicles. And then red team, the adversarial simulation. And sometimes people just don't jump right into this. And maybe someone that's worked in social engineering, have wor worked as a generalist. Uh, this, some light web application is good here, but a lot of your skills there is gonna be more focused on your your network pen testing, as well as your social engineering. And how to become a pen tester. This is usually the uh, reason people attend this talk. They're wanting to get into pen testing. So you need to understand the technology before you can secure it or break into it. So you really need to know networking, operating systems at a sysadmin level, meaning you can go into Windows, you can disable the network adapter, connect to networks, make configuration changes. Because if you get access to the system as a pen tester, you want to see what else you can do. If you've only got like a shell or command line access, if you know the command line of that operating system, you can shut down firewalls or services depending on your level of access to that system. So you really need to know those, those operating systems, or otherwise you'll spend a lot of time on Google trying to figure that as you go. And you need that base knowledge so you can utilize your time better. And then understanding security because understanding security makes it easier to break into. And then application and hardware, other helpful areas to know as a pen tester. And so you so if you have your technology knowledge, then the next thing you gotta do is you got to learn to hack. And this is kind of where the point I was at when I became a pen tester I had done vulnerability scans, network, as well as web application. So I needed to learn how to hack. So I would started my job and I signed up for the OSCP certification course. And that's one of the courses I've learned the most about pen testing because you really learn how to hack in that course. And so it really helped, helped me in my career. And conferences, classes, you know, like these conferences, you know, we have workshops here and different talks on the subject. Going to meetings and meetups, your local DEF CON groups, your your hacker associations and stuff, that's a good way to get in and learn about the different types of techniques. And the more views and ideas of pen testing you get and hacking, the better, because everyone does it a little bit different. And so someone may explain something that clicks with you better. And sometimes it's a matter of seeing this topic more than once to really get it. Uh, Self-study, home labs are great. Everyone should have a home lab. There's a lot of good videos out there on YouTube. Uh, there's different tutorials that you can follow for self-study, blogs, articles, and Twitter. And towards the end of this, we're gonna we'll cover some different resources in these areas that'll help you on your your studies to become a pen tester. But Twitter is a great place to get information. You're gonna find out about all the latest conferences where you can learn hacking techniques and pen testing. So that's a really good, great resource. A lot of good people to follow there too. And so. To become a pen tester, you really need the hacker mindset. And so the hacker mindset is the ability to think like a hacker, be able to find ways into, and vulnerabilities into the system, 
the hacker mindset is, is kind of a combination of creativity and analytical thinking. And so this is like one of the areas, there's other areas in IT and security that are creative, but this is one area that really calls upon your, your creativity. And so developing the hacker mindset is similar to troubleshooting. You know, the first time you install Windows or Linux, and if it goes perfect, that's fine. But then once you start having problems connecting the network, or you install Linux or Windows another time and it doesn't go just right, then you have to troubleshoot it. And you learn so much from troubleshooting and just kind of like hacking you. When you try something that doesn't work, then you know other directions to go, other things to try and continue your research and continue to enumerate the system, performing more recon. So, and then along the way, you'll learn different hacks. And so you'll identify, okay, this, this is a Java server. You're able to upload uh, a shell to it, you know, a, a malicious file to create a shell and get access to the system. So you kind of learn the different types of attacks and put those together. And the best way to develop this is through repetition and hands-on hands -on hacking experience. CTFs, bug bounties, home labs, just practice in that. And you just kind of build this base level of knowledge that after a while, there's just things that you just build, you're able to know how to do without referring to your notes. It's good to keep notes, but you once you, like in the area of IT, you know, you know how to connect to the network, you know how to set up Apache web server, these different things. Once you know those a little better, then you're able to get through your testing better. You're building up that base knowledge and able to function better as a pen tester. And so the pen tester blueprint formula is technology knowledge plus security knowledge plus the hacker mindset. So these are the items that you need to be successful as a pen tester. And this takes time. And one of the things I want to tell anyone getting into this, be patient, give yourself time. Hacking wasn't easy for me to learn. It took some time to learn it. So it takes time. So give yourself, you know, time and be patient. Don't try to rush it and take your time as you learn. You'll better absorb and remember things if you take your time. Don't try to rush through it. So where do you start? So you want to you, you need to develop a plan. So you kind of you're going to do a, a gap analysis on what you know and what you need to know. So we've discussed that you need technology knowledge. You need to understand the technologies, the security, as well as the hacker mindset. So we need to fill in those gaps. Some examples here. If you have no IT experience, then start learning the basics, the operating systems, hardware, and networking. A good place to start here is look at like your A plus certification type material. Not saying that you have to get the A plus certification, but there's videos out there like Professor Messer that you can go through, learn the operating systems, learn basic networking, and then progress into like network plus type materials or even like the CCNA. Learn your networking and then you know, if you're, you've got IT experience, fill in those gaps of things that you're, you don't have experience with. If you're a, a uh, help desk person, you may not be dealing with Linux much. So learn Linux, learn security and networking. So just fill in those gaps that you don't, that you don't know. And InfoSec experience, same there. You, you may be to a level that you're understanding Linux, understanding networking, but you got to get the hacking down. So CTFs and bug bounties and labs. And my, my, uh, advice for everyone is build a home lab. Even if you're an experienced pen tester, IT person, security analyst, having a home lab is good. Even as a pen tester, we have labs set up that we can test our proof of concept codes. If we have some exploit we want to perform on a vulnerability we found on the network or something new comes out, we want to test that ahead of time because sometimes uh, exploits can have adverse react effects on a network. So you could crash a system. So you want to test it first and work on any kind of bugs. So this is good and it's a way to learn techniques because you may not run across all these scenarios in a pen test. So having a lab, you're able to test all the newest, latest attacks in your home lab. And then your labs. So I kind of categorize this and this can vary. The minimalist lab is one of my favorites. And this is just having virtualized hosts on your, your laptop or your desktop computer. So you're running a virtual machine with uh, Kali Linux or, and then your attack platforms, the, the vulnerable VMs that you want to attack. And then you have your dedicated labs where you can have like separate systems. You can have like a one computer with just your vulnerable VMs on it and you can get more advanced. You can have separate servers 
you know, you can hook up some Raspberry Pis to your network for your for like client computers or little servers. Uh, you can set up routers and switches, even wireless networks. So you can bu build it as complex as you want to, and that's a good way to learn learn these uh, technologies. But keep in mind also too, the more complex you build it, the more troubleshooting you may have to spend when you're working in your lab. If something doesn't work right, then you have to go back and and fix that. So keep that in mind as you're building your lab. And I personally have uh, a small server that I built with VMs on it, as well as I run some vulnerable VMs on my laptop. And so your home lab attack platform. So you have to have something that your tools are on that you're hacking with. And so Kali Linux is my, my top choice. And Parrot OS is a good uh, operating system as well for Linux. I recently used that for the first time. I did a wireless pen test. Kali Linux wasn't working out so well with the drivers for some of my uh, network cards that I was using. And some of the tools just with the newer version of Kali Linux, uh, some of the updates, trying to use some of the wire, wireless tools just didn't work right. And Parrot OS, everything worked like a champ. And I was able to under, install other tools pretty easily. And Ubuntu is another route to go. You can use the pen tester framework scripts from TrustedSec and install all the pen testing tools on there and run it from that perspective. And then there's also your Windows option, uh, Windows 10 with the Commando VM scripts. It runs some automated scripts similar to what the pen tester framework does, but this installs the pen testing and hacking tools on Windows. And it also sets up security so Windows Defender doesn't go in and delete your pen testing tools and exploit code from your system. So it sets the security up for, for you there. So that's a nice added feature. As your pen testing platform, I recommend, even like from a professional perspective, I like to have like either a, a Intel-based system that I'm running Ubuntu as my host OS or Mac OS with VMs on that or Windows. And I will run like a, a Windows VM for the Windows tools as well as a Linux VM. So uh, it's good to get the experience with the Windows tools. Linux, I mean, get experience with the Windows tools because the Linux stuff is very popular, but it's good to learn the Windows stuff because there's some tools there that can that are very helpful on a pen test. And home lab targets. So you can create virtual machines. There's a lot of targets on Vulnhub that you can download. A lot of CTFs will will upload their their the VMs of their CTFs. So you have those to play around with, as well as there's Metasploitable 2 and 3. These are two uh, VMs I highly recommend starting out with. They're really dense with vulnerabilities that you can exploit. To get the same uh, similar uh, benefits from other VMs, you may have to install multiple VMs or vulnerable applications to get the same amount of targets. But with Metasploitable 2, you have a lot of vulnerabilities. So one of those VMs can keep you busy for a while. And there's a lot of walkthroughs on those two VMs that you can go through and learn how to pen test. You can look at the different walkthroughs and compare how other people are doing it differently and pick up some helpful techniques. And then OWASP WebGoat, as well as uh, Juice Shop and several other vulnerable VMs that you can find on OWASP.org's website are great. And you can build your own VM targets. Go to ExploitDB, download the vulnerable software, build your own targets at home, uh, just like testing your proof of, proof of concept code, some new vulnerability comes out and maybe it's been patched, then you can go back and get vulnerable versions of the software and set that up in your home lab to test it. Then of course, like your, your uh, different vulnerable VMs, like hack the box and try hack me are good options as well. And some recommended reading here. So uh, the first semester of or actually the first year I taught the ethical hacking class, I used the book Penetration Testing, a Hands-On Introduction to Hacking by Georgia Weedman. This is a great book for anyone starting out. It takes you through setting up your own home lab. So you can go through and set up your lab. Uh, this is, was a really great book for anyone that's going through the OSCP. They cover a lot of topics there that are helpful in preparing for the OSCP. And the next book I'd recommend, or the next books would be the Hacker Playbook 2 and 3. And don't skip version 2 because version 3 gets more into red teaming, which is good, but you don't want to miss out on the items in the Hacker Playbook 2. So the 
hack the first book, the penetration testing hands-on introduction to hacking will help you build a base and the hackers playbooks will help you, you hone your skills and, and improve your, your pen testing skills with that. Then the hackers playbook exploiting, discovering exploiting flaws, security flaws is a great book created by uh, one of the creators of Burp Suite. So this is a really good book for web application pen testing. And the Red Team Field Manual, that's, a, that's another good book that's filled with a lot of different command lines for Linux, Windows, uh, PowerShell, a lot of different admin related functions. And there's another book out that I didn't put on, I forgot to update this slide, but another book that I recommend getting, this is good for anyone, Blue Team or Red Team, uh, pen testers, but the the operation operator handbook. This is a good book. Uh, it's a lot thicker than the the Red Team Field Manual. This covers anything from like Kubernetes. Uh, gets into a lot of net advanced networking stuff. So this is a really great resource to have. And it's available in an ebook format, whereas the Red Team Field Manual is only in a printed format. And here's some learning resources. So I've got these divided out by paid and free resources. And if you look at the top section, I start these by from most expensive to least expensive. SANS Institute, if you're, these are usually courses that if your company's paying for your training, that's great. There are $7,200 courses typically for a six day course. They've got some other ones that are like two days long, like the Red Team course that are like $3,800. They're less, a little less expensive. But then you get to your e-learn security. These are like from a thousand to like thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars per cl per class. It's really good. Offensive security. They have a lot of advanced pen testing related uh, courses there, like the OSCP. That's a good one. And then virtual hacking labs. That's like seven hundred fifty dollars for a year's worth of access to this hacking lab, and it has an online course with it. That's a good one to prep for the OSCP. And then you have Pentester Academy. Pentester Academy has a large library of pen testing videos covering anything from mobile to wireless to JavaScript for pen testers, uh, Python for pen testers, different uh, topics related to Wireshark, T Shark, some light forensic stuff, Active Directory security and hacking. And then there's Pentester Lab. This one focuses more on web application pen testing but where they differ from some of the other the other resources are that they go into types of exploits that will get you command line access so that you're able to actually hack the system and not just discover vulnerabilities and that one's pretty pretty cost effective in a really good course you can build a lot of linux security skills from that course they teach you how you can exploit the different uh unix and linux vulnerabilities and then Practical Pen Test Labs is $64 for lifetime access. It's mainly a Linux based lab. You access it through VPN, and they've got like a short little PDF uh, course showing you how to do port scans and stuff to get started. So that's a very cost effective uh, resource, and I play, kind of played around with that. It's a lot of fun and, and, and good to have. And then you get into, we get into our free resources. Uh, Bug Crowd University and Hacker One. These are bug bug bounty resources. Uh, they have videos as well as different tutorials and stuff. Hacker One has an online CTF, and they actually you go through the CTF and the training modules to learn how to do web application pen testing, which helps you in turn be a bounty a bug bounty hunter. And those skills can also be used as a pen tester. Sans has a really good blog, the Sans Pen Testing blog. There's uh, different cheat sheets on different tools and techniques out there. So this is a really good resource. And then hackingtutorials.org. This is from the creators of the virtual hacking labs that I mentioned on the above part of the slide. And this is tutorials related to Nmap, Metasploit, different types of exploits out there. So it's a really good free resource for learning. And then cyberary.it has some free resources, some paid, but there's a lot of good uh, free materials out there on pen testing. And then Web Security Academy from the creators of the Web Application Hackers Handbook and Burb Suite. The Web Web Security Academy out there in Port Swigger has uh, a lot of learning materials. They have 
learning content plus online labs that are completely free. So it's a really good place to learn. And then OWASP, the OWASP website, the creators of the OWASP top 10. There's the OWASP testing guide for web app pen testing, as well as testing guides and recommendations for mobile and IoT. And then hackthebox.eu is another good place. There's some good VMs on there. TJ Null recommends some VMs on there for uh, preparing for the OSCP. And then over the wire CTF, as well as under the wire CTF. Over the wire is more Linux based, and then under the wire is more Windows based and, Power and PowerShell based. So those are really good. And to find these resources, if you go to my website, thehackermaker.com, learning dash resources, there's a link to this page with links to the resources. So you can check that out if you don't have the, the screenshot of the slide. In different certifications, this is a question I get a lot. You know, uh, what got me into teaching and doing conference stuff and workshops and all that was originally just sharing information with people. I really like that teaching and conferences was a way to do that on a bigger scale. So the question you always get is, you know, do I need certifications? And which certifications do I need? To get your foot in the door, it's very helpful to have a certification because sometimes it can really be difficult to get that first interview. If you really understand and know it, then you could possibly get through the interview, but just getting your foot in the door can be difficult. So things like the CEH and Pentest Plus, you know, could possibly get you interviews because HR and hiring managers are really familiar with the, the CEH. But to get into your certifications that, that are going to help you from a standpoint of the knowledge you're gaining from that and, and looked at by a lot of hiring managers are your, your SANS GPEN cert, your OSCP, your GXPN by SANS and the OSCE. These are pretty similar certs between the SANS and offensive security. Although with offensive security, you actually have to perform pen tests. You actually have to hack into systems to pass the exam. Whereas the SANS certifications are more uh, question and answer They'll give you items to be able to say, what does this NMAP scan do or whatever that, that type of stuff. It's good information and, uh, and very helpful for getting employment. But like the, my OSCP, I've gotten out of the, the hands-on portion, technical portions of interviews before because the hiring manager or the person recommending me said, you know, he was able to pass the OSCP. He's able to do our lab. So it's it's a... The OSCP is, has given me a lot of mileage as far as in my pen test career. And, the, this, and then the, the other one, you know, the difference between, you know, the, we have the intermediate, intermediate and advanced, and these are, these are all good to have. One of the things I'll, I'll say, too, is while you're preparing for these certifications, learn the topics. The ones like the, you know, your CEH or pen test plus, where you're not actually having to do a pen test or stuff or hack things, you need to make sure to learn it because when you go through the interview, you're going to need to be able to answer the questions. So make sure to learn it. Don't just pass the certification test. The information you learn is going to be helpful as a pen tester and helpful in the interview. And this is going to help you answer the questions as you go through your interviews. And there's also some other good the other certifications out there through eLearn Security. Although their their certifications are starting to gain more uh, notoriety, people are starting to become familiar with it. It's really good, and I can tell you as far as taking those certification courses to learn how to pen test, they're really good. You'll learn how to pen test because you have to perform a pen test and write a report. So those are very, very valuable, although not as quite sought out yet. I think that'll change as popularity catches on. And job hunting tips. So if you're wanting to become a pen tester, professional networking, you know, conferences you know, like you're doing here, different meetups, go to the different meetup groups, get to know people. My last three permanent jobs, full-time jobs have been through connections I had in the security community. My second pen testing job was through the founder Wirefall from Dallas Hackers Association. He referred me for a job. Uh, I got my job at US Bank from attending a San, uh, an actual an OWASP meeting, local OWASP meeting. One of the people there presenting told me the U.S. Bank was hiring, so I was able to get referred and get a job there from that referral. And I referred people that I know from the community that were looking for pen test jobs. You know, you get out there and don't just show up, get to know people, network. 
people talk to you, they know you're interested, then they can pass on your information and share jobs with you. Uh, I've seen people get hired out of our local meetup groups. A, a young co uh, college grad from UT Arlington did a, a discussion or did a presentation at our local DEF CON group on malware uh, analysis. And the hiring manager for a major financial company was there, saw his presentation and needed an instant response person, asked for his resume and he got a job. And LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn, make sure you fill that out. This is your online resume. This is gonna get people to you. Unless you're getting resumes out there, they're not gonna find you. But if you're on LinkedIn, they see the keywords for pen testing, they will look at your, your profile and that's how, you know, to help you get your foot in the door, help you get interviews and keep it professional. Make sure that when you're posting on LinkedIn, treat it professionally, it's not Facebook. So you wanna make sure you keep it professional Make sure you put the the you know the information on courses you've taken, you know the type of experience you have and your skills. That way, people can find that easier. And interview tips. So when you're getting ready for an interview, prepare for your interview. Even if, as an experienced infosec person and pen tester, I find that I do better on interviews if I prepare for it. There may be some thing that you're not touching or you haven't worked with in, that, in, in the current job you're in in a while. So sometimes go back and review review those topics. Uh, the OWASP top 10, pen testers are always asked these questions during interviews, cross-site scripting, SQL injection are two of the most popular items you're gonna be questioned on during a pen test interview. So understanding those vulnerabilities, not just memorizing, understand the vulnerabilities, the different variations and types like SQL injection, you wanna make sure you understand blind SQL injection, time-based SQL injection, cross-site scripting, your stored and reflected cross-site scripting. Understand those and how to remediate those. Because those are the questions that are gonna answer you, ask you. So really go over there and know that. And knowing the OWASP top 10 is gonna help you a lot in your career. And then some of the stuff that's, that you wouldn't expect to get asked, like the basics like three-way TCP handshake or OSI model, people that are more experienced in management that may have been away from things for a while. They don't, they may not be as technical and may not ask some of the more current type questions. So they're gonna ask you stuff about the OSI model in a three-way TCP handshake. This is kind of, you know, basic stuff, you know, IT 101 that they expect you to know. So kind of know those when you're going to the interview, that'll go a long way. One of my last job interviews, I had the director ask me questions on the OSI model in TCP handshake during my interview. So not, a lot of times those aren't technical interviews, but they will throw in some, some technical questions to get a better idea of you know, your skill set and your knowledge. And uh, this is my contact information. Uh, there's the link for Pwn School up here. So we stream our talks each month, as well as we have a YouTube channel with recorded talks on there. So feel, please feel free to check that out. We've got a meeting coming up Wednesday. And on the Pwn School website, you can find links to our meetup page to get the links to be able to access the streams, as well as the YouTube channel with the recordings on there. And we have a link to our Slack channel. So we have a lot of industry professionals on there that have pen testing background, blue team background. We've got people with thread hunting experience. So it's a really good place to network and share ideas and get information. And I, I teach ethical hacking classes and web app pen testing classes originally in college, which recently rebranded the Dallas Community Colleges are now Dallas College. And then I'm also check out the Uncommon Journey podcast on ITSP Magazine. And here's my social media information, my email address. Feel free to reach out to me because I'm always answering questions and happy to help people out. This stuff is my hobby. It's not only my job. Not only what I teach, this is my hobby. You know, my ideal hobby is going to, to DEF CON and Black Hat. That's fun for me. So I live and breathe this stuff. I like to talk about it all the time. So feel free to reach out to me, ask me questions. I'm happy to help share any kind of learning uh, materials. If there's any specific thing you want to get into and you need more information, I'm happy to help you. So check those out and follow me on Twitter. I'm always posting about any free conferences and, and trainings I'm doing. So connect there. And so if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer your questions. Bill, we have a number of questions that are coming from the track three uh, 
Discord channel. So okay. if you don't if you don't mind, I'd go ahead and just start those off for you. Uh, what about documentation during an event? Um, the hardest part for me is writing the report. Is there a template that you find helpful to leverage? Maybe a punch list you use of all the things you cover. Yeah, what, what I recommend is looking at, when you look at stuff like the P-Test standard, they kind of show you things that you need to do during your pen test. And as far as documenting that, a great resource is Dratus. They have, Dratus has a community edition of their software, and it's a report writing and collaboration tool. And I believe it's if it's not installed by default on Kali Linux, it's in the, the Kali Linux repository. So you just can do like an apt install uh, Dratus and it'll install that. But what Dratus does is not only does it collaborate, it's a report generating tool, and it also has like a checklist. So you can define your pen testing methodology and it creates your checklist. So I've used the pro version before and it works great. And the community edition also has this checklist. So you can choose the P-Test standard for your typical pen test, and you will select on what portion of the pen test, and it'll show you different things to try for the type of pen test you're doing. So it, it's kind of a good reminder and a checklist. And aside from the report generating functions, because there's not a lot of, it's hard to find a good report template out there, but this will let you track your, your pen test as you're going along. You upload your NMAP scans to it. You upload your Nessus scans, Burp Suite, and then you create a report out of it. It takes all that information and generates a report for you. So this is a way to keep track of your pen test. And also note taking. You use something like Joplin, Evernote, KeepNote, OneNote, one of these note taking tools. And as you're pen testing, go through and attach your Nessus output or take screenshots. Take your screenshots as you're going along. If you exploit a system, it may not be exploitable next time. You may have ran it. Sometimes the exploits does something to the TCP ports that you're not able to do that exploit again. So as you're going, make sure you're taking notes. So that way you remember how you exploited it. Take your screenshots, your notes, and populate that notebook, that note-taking tool. Create a node for each IP address or even group of IPs that you run your in-map scans again. Take the output of each one of your tools. That way you can refer back to it uh, to look for you know, exploits you can use against those vulnerabilities, as well as when you write your report. You've got screenshots there, you've got output from InMap, all your evidence there. So when you go to build your report, you've got it nice, neatly organized. Another question from our channel. Do you feel that the news and others have maligned the term hacker? I noticed that you use the term cyber criminal appropriately and would like your thoughts on this. Yes, it's it's exactly the media and that's where it came from. So most people that know the story of hackers back when, you know, hacking at one time, the hacker term was really people, if you think about the hacker space, maker space, where people are building things or trying to modify technology to do different, different things, that's where hacking came from. In the media, the news would refer to cyber criminals as hackers. So that's how it got coined is that way. So we like to make sure, you know, because it's even locksmiths know how to break into a house but they do it ethically. So as security professionals, we need to kind of help try to correct the mindset. That way people separate it, you know, because it kind of gives us, makes us look bad and, and, and trying to build the trust. You know, media has made hackers sound bad. So, so definitely it's the, been the news that has coined. That's where the, where, you know, cyber criminals got the tag from. Um, another uh, post from inside of our channel, uh, one of the uh, attendees is asking, uh, the guy that has CEH certification after the training, he is the fresher for the job uh, and he would not know where to apply and how to apply. How can he enter into the field of cybersecurity if he is a um, newbie without much experience? Well, one of the things I'd recommend is, try, is do bug bounties and, and CTFs. Uh, that way you're going to get the experience network, go to different meetups and connect with people online because people try to help you out there. But uh, is trying to get connect. Sometimes if you're you may have to take a job in IT or security and then work your way into a pen testing role. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you say you're just you, you got a CEH cert or you just finished school, 
nothing wrong with taking a SOC analyst job. You can learn a lot about that. So I don't know if anyone here follows Tinker Sec from, from Twitter. He's like a really great hacker and he never took any certification courses, all self-study, no certs. And, uh, you know, he's, he's done well with, without having the certifications and he just knowing, you know, knowing people in the community and he was a SOC analyst. So he worked in as a SOC analyst and someone heard him speak at Dallas hackers and he got his foot in just, you know, you just have to get out there and, and, and network with people and, you know, and it doesn't have to be like a, a meet meetup that's geared towards pen testing. You're going to find a lot of your opportunities in more of the generic security type meetups, your ISSA meetings, because these are where the hiring managers are going to looking for people. And just keep practicing and, and working on it. You know, the bug bounty stuff, I mean, you could go to, with the bug bounties, you can get invited to do pen tests. They, a lot of these bug bounties companies also do pen tests along with bug bounties. So you can get invited to do pen tests. And then once you're doing pen tests, you got this on your resume. And, you know, working on projects, working on scripts, volunteer some of these open source projects is a good way to get that information, good stuff on your resume. Okay, Philip, we have uh, one more question, if you don't mind. No, no, no. Uh, what is your advice to a current help desk person who wants to become a pen tester red teamer? I got the OSCP in my pocket. Do they already have their OSCP? Or is that what they're focusing on? That's, uh, I believe, what they're trying to focus on. Yeah, the OSCP is going to help you, is, is going to help you get your foot in the door there and where you're at. One of the things, it's easier to sometimes get into a role if you already work somewhere. So if your company has a security department, you know, just let them know you're interested in security because I uh, expressed my interest of wanting to move into security back in like 2000, 2000 when I worked at the company and it took me to 2004 to actually get to move into security. They knew I had the interest at the time, they didn't have the roles. But yeah, I work on the, the OSCP the information you get from that, if you can land an interview and you you pass the OSCP and really dig in and learn that stuff, you're going to be able to get through a technical interview. Well, Phil, as always, thank you for submitting your time and for your presentation today. Personally, I can say this is one of the best uh, presentations I've seen, and that resonates across the Discord channel that we're seeing. So thank you for sharing all of this um, immense information that you've gathered for us. And thank you for your contribution to the uh, cybersecurity community. Thank you for the opportunity. I always love the chance to share and, and educate. So this is, uh, is great. Like a, one of the things, I, you know, like they say, it's better to give than receive. And, you know, sometimes I think I get more than this than the people that, that are actually asking for the information. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Yeah. Great content. Yep. Thank you.